I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from the battlefront as Ukraine fights on in Bakhmut, discuss the activities of Russian trolls, and, at the end of today's panel, we have a catch-up with an undercover volunteer helping supply Ukrainian frontline troops. So do stay around to listen to that. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 6th of March, one year and 10 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Foreign Correspondent Colin Freeman, and our first guest is Finnish journalist Jessica Arrow, author of the book Putin's Trolls, on the front lines of Russia's information war against the world. And, as discussed, we have an extra catch-up interview with an undercut for volunteer who's supplying Ukrainian frontline troops. That's after the panel at the end of today's episode. But I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from the front lines. Yeah, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So Bakhmut is the biggie. I'll talk about that in a moment. Otherwise, just some quick updates around the place. So the death toll from Russia's missile strike on an apartment block in Zaporizhia last Thursday has risen to 13. So early this morning, the bodies of an eight-month-old girl and her family were retrieved from the rubble. There's still people missing. President Zelensky said he's going to hold Russia accountable and said the terrorist state wants to turn every day for our people into a day of terror, but evil will not reign in our land. Seven people still missing there, as I, as I mentioned. Elsewhere, Sergei Shoigu, Russia's defence minister, he's in Mariupol, so the, the city on the coast that... Um, the stout defence in the Azovstal steel plant there for months that ended last summer. That's that, that sort of blasted city there, Mariupol. Sergei Shoigu is visiting. And also last night, overnight last night, Sunday, Monday, a number of Shahid 136 drones, the Iranian-made drones, fired Ukraine, many from the Bryansk region of southern Russia. So this is a couple of hundred k's northeast of Kiev, that, that part of there, that, that border area there. Ukraine says it shot down 13 of 15 uh, Shahid 136 fired Fired at it with no casualties reported for the for the two that got through. Now Bakhmut, city in the in the Donetsk region, Russia have been fighting over it or fighting for it, I should say, for for months. Mainly using the Wagner Group mercenaries, although in recent weeks we think there's been regular Russian forces, and by regular Russian forces we now mean mainly conscripts and mobilised men fighting there as well because Wagner have not been able to to break through. The backdrop to this is the is the sort of intra-governmental politics in Moscow. So you've got Wagner, the head of Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin. He's trying to set himself up, we think, with political ambition, but also his business model of exporting Wagner as a security tool for the Russian state around the world. That's going to be severely damaged if they don't have a if they can't come up with the goods on a on a battlefield. It's one thing to stooge around Mali shooting unarmed people. It's quite another to. Uh, to, to not be able to mix it when you're up against a, a, a decent force such as the Ukrainian defence. So, you know, Wagner have to have to take a win out of this. For weeks now, Wagner have been saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're about to win. We've got people on the edge. We're about to get into Bakhmut, blah, blah, blah. They have to say that for their own internal dynamics. Now, like a stop clock that tells the correct time twice a day, every now and again, he is correct. And it looks as if Wagner or the Russian forces are about to take back moot. They are, they seem to be trying to, well, we think they're trying to encircle the city. They seem to be on three sides. So to the north, the east and the south, it allows the route of extraction for the Ukrainian forces there is getting squeezed by the hour. So it looks as if they, that, it, that the city will fall. The Institute for Study of War, US-based think tank, are saying that it looks like Ukraine might be in the process of trying to start a fighting withdrawal, as in, you know, get out in, in as good order as you can. But Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of Wagner, he's saying he's talked about shell hunger, quote unquote, shell hunger, that is hampering his force's ability to take the city. That might be convenient to, to chime this narrative of why aren't you doing any better? 
At the same time, we've got the Russian military blogger community, particularly Rybar, who've got over a million subscribers on Telegram. They're saying the armed forces of Ukraine are withdrawing forces from the central and western regions of Bakhmut. The west is the is the open flank for, for Ukraine, so that's the way they would get out. Rybar saying these efforts are only intended to buy time and delay the Russian units as much as possible. I mean, yes, that, that's self-evident. We've said that for, for months now. That seems to be what, what Ukraine have been doing. And also U.S. Secretary of State, or sorry, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is visiting Jordan today. He has said, quote, the fall of Bakhmut won't necessarily mean that the Russians have changed the tide of this fight, unquote. So what, what do we think is going on here? Now, let's go back to Sun Tzu, famous uh, Chinese uh, military strategist, 500, died 500 years or B.C., thereabouts, B.C.E. He was always suggesting, he was suggesting that, that if you encircle an enemy position, then the enemy know they are, they're probably not going to get out of there, but they will go down fighting. So they will fight like, like dogs, you know. So if you encircle a city, expect a big fight. If you allow a route out, if you leave one flank open, then the enemy will have, you know, somewhere in the back of their mind, they'll be thinking, oh, I might just be able to get out of here alive. And they might try and dash for it. They might try and run for it. They might try and get some forces out. But the fight that you are left with is going to be a smaller fight. So it makes good tactical sense not to completely encircle or like besiege a city and leave one flank open for the for the enemy to try and to try and get out in good order. So that seems to be what's happened here. That's the, that's kind of realities on the ground. But I, you know, is this Russian operational genius that they've left one flank open, or is this all that they're capable of doing? They are exhausted. They cannot push any further. They've been doing this. They've been at it for months. That this this open flank to the west is there. Is that is that by design or, or luck? I suggest it's by well, if not luck, by the by the defence that Ukraine have been able to put up here. I don't think this is some Russian tactical genius that we are seeing unfolding they've tried to wipe the city out they, they effectively have with artillery there's about we think about four thousand civilians left in there from about seventy thousand before um, the russians arrived so th- there's virtually nothing left of the city and nobody left in it it doesn't do anything it doesn't go anywhere it's not a major logistics hub it's not a big rail intersection the city means nothing except it's symbolic for Russia and and obviously also for Ukraine to a certain degree but t- taking that city has come at extreme cost extreme cost for for Russia I- I've suggested before yeah you know, I've mentioned Winston Churchill after after Dunkirk when he's when he's you know armies don't want to be going backwards and Winston Churchill after Dunkirk said victories are not born of glorious retreats okay so you don't want to be going backwards you want to be going forwards against the enemy but it's not a question of of the amount of ground you've got, it's it's how much fight you've got left in you. And for this, I would point you to Phillips O'Brien, who um, he speaks for, uh, or he's a, he's a, he's the the great military thinker, strategy thinker up at the University of St Andrews. He suggested over the weekend, he suggested we should have a look at Nathaniel Green, who was one of George Washington's commanders in the American Revolution. Nathaniel Green, General Green, he took on the Brits over the Battle of Bunker Hill in June 1775. The Brits actually won that, but we never went any further. And Washington's forces then, because they'd exacted such a price from the Brits, that they, they, they were willing, so Washington's forces, General Green's forces, were willing to take the casualties for the, the fight that they were drawing out of the British. And after that Battle of Bunker Hill, Nathaniel Green's famous as saying, I wish we could sell them another hill at the same price. And I think that's kind of what's happening at the moment in Bakhmut. I think Ukraine are willing to take the casualties. We don't know what the casualty figures are, but they're, you know, they're not going to be pretty. But we think they, they are willing to take the casualties for the price that they are extracting from Russia. There were figures over the weekend from senior Ukrainian commanders that it's seven to one in terms of casualties, wounded and dead. Every, every seven dead Russians, one dead Ukrainian, same, same, same sort of wounded, that, that kind of metric. I mean, if that's correct, it, you know, it's never going to be exact. It's probably going to be you know, a mishmash depending on, on whether you're talking wounded, dead and where you are and what have you. But I mean, that's a huge toll. And if that is a price that Ukraine is willing to pay and they are they are content to continue fighting because of the toll it is taking out of the Russian forces, then then that is very, very interesting because the relative strengths of the of the army will be will be dented severely. So just like Nathaniel Green was saying back in in 1775, it's not about geography. It's not about who owns which bit bit of real estate. Of course you don't want to don't want to surrender all your real estate to the enemy because then there's then the war's over. But you know, don't think of it just in terms of geography. Think about it in terms of what it does for the relative strengths of the two militaries. And I think Ukraine is is 
planning to uh, planning to get get out with what they can, but they are at the moment um, exerting or extracting such a toll from the, the Russian war machine that they are they are content to let Russia continue to pound away at it. It, it is extremely violent there. It looks like the city is going to fall, but like I say, it's not the geography. It's the relative strengths we should be focusing on. I'll take a little pause. Thanks, Tom. There's a few things we can probably come back and talk about in that, I think. And there are some other updates from you I want to discuss. But before that, let's go to Colin Freeman. Colin, you've just got back from a stint reporting in Ukraine. Can you tell us about your time down in Kherson? Who did you speak to and what did you see? Yes, so um, Kherson, just to, to remind readers, is this city on Ukraine's Black Sea coast. It's a former shipbuilding port, home to about 300,000 people. And it fell to Russian control back in March of last year. It was the first city to be occupied by the Kremlin. That went on for about eight months until November last year when the Russians pulled out again. Now, the reason they pulled out was partly because of a a partisan campaign waged by the locals while under occupation. A lot of it was sort of classic partisan stuff, you know, occasional assassinations of Russian officials, the odd car bombing here, but of uh, a few acts of sabotage, that sort of thing. And, And a lot of that would have been carried out by trained professionals. But supporting them all the time were networks of ordinary people who acted as informants, passing on important details about the the Russian presence, such, for example, as what hotels they commandeered for their top brass to live in while they were in Kherson, what buildings they were using as barracks for the ordinary soldiers, and what industrial estates and other um, places they were using to stash their um, their armoured vehicles and their tanks and um, their logistics operations in And um, these details would then be passed on to Ukrainian forces based outside of Kherson, who would use them, you try and build up an intelligence picture. And then before you know it, that hotel that the uh, Russians had uh, requisitioned for themselves, some nice comfy place in downtown Kherson, would suddenly get a high Mars missile landing on it, etc. But as I say, the, the people we interviewed, they were part of this partisan network, but they were not trained partisans in any sense. They were often bartenders, the housewives, local counselors, people who you know had no particular military skills, but that also gave them a, a considerable advantage in that the Russians never really suspected them of, of doing anything. So, for example, we, we interviewed a lady called Anastasia who, was, who ran a bar that was frequented by Russian soldiers. She said that she, she hadn't really been poli- very political prior to the war. She was not happy, though, at the Russians turning up in her, uninvited into her home city. And uh, nor was she happy about the way they behaved in her bar. They used to sit around getting very drunk, trying to chat up the, her and her waitresses a lot, and, and generally being rather boorish in their behaviour. If they didn't get served quick enough, they would um, threaten to throw the waitresses in jail, that sort of thing. So you can imagine that it was probably quite tempting for people like Anastasia to join this network of informants anyway. And I think it's probably fair to say that that aspect of it didn't necessarily involve that much cloak and dagger stuff. A lot of the Ukrainians who stayed in Kherson had friends who were either in the military or had served in the military or who were otherwise able to put them in touch with people who were in the military to whom they could then pass on information and tips about where the Russians were. Often this was just done, you know, I I think they had special apps to do it on um, secure messaging messaging channels like um, Telegram and so on. But uh, apparently a lot of them just used their Instagram feeds and so on and so forth. They they didn't seem to think that the, the, the Russian state was particularly sophisticated in terms of its ways of um, catching people doing that. And so Anastasia, a lot of the time, she would be busy serving these Russian commanders, watching them get very drunk, and then meanwhile just quietly noticing anybody who had um, high-ranking chevrons on his uniform form anything denoting him as a as an important commander and then just passing on oh you know such and such passed through my bar today he was here for a while and not really knowing what the information would be used for and in some ways not really wanting to know it either because she you know she said she didn't really want to be aware of having blood directly on her hands but i think it's she she certainly was aware that, that this was all probably helping to build up 
an intelligence picture um, that, that would ultimately quite often, you know, potentially lead to some of these Russian soldiers coming to a sticky end. And then we met another woman, a, um, a housewife by her own description, who used to just wander around the town with her 10 year old boy, uh, t- saying that she was just taking him out to get some fresh air. Picture of innocence, you could say, but all the time keeping a very close eye on certain buildings where it was thought that Russian troops were using as bases and so on, and reporting that information back um, to her handler, as it were. And all this just really, I think, primarily helped to build up the picture for Ukrainian military intelligence of what was going on in the city and allowed them to direct some very accurate fire, especially with the uh, the long-range HIMARS missiles, onto the, onto the city, pinpointing things accurately, hopefully minimising civilian casualties, I think. And that ultimately helped turn the tide of the Russian occupation and I think eventually led to it being uh, somewhat untenable. Colin, can I ask, what was Anastasia's plan if if she was captured? How would she get word to to um, the people she worked with? And then, just zooming out from her story a little bit, what was your impression of Hazan at the moment? It's still under quite a lot of heavy fire from the Russian forces. What was it like being there? Yeah, well, Anastasia was well aware that if she got caught, she would be in very big trouble. Um, she would be taken off, most likely tortured and possibly worse. She would also knew that if she got caught, then her handler could potentially be tracked down as well. So she had a, a vague plan that if, if she ever got Russians knocking at her door or apprehending her and she realised that she'd been rumbled, if she had time, she was going to send a message to her handler. And uh, in true bartender style, it was going to be a reference to a cocktail. She was just going to send him a message saying Negroni. And that that would be the code word for him to break off all contact and realise that she was compromised. Very that that bit that bit of it, I must say, was rather cloak and dagger. But the, yes, more generally, um, uh, so the, the Russians left Kherson in November of last year, and there was big street parties then, a sense of the of the city being liberated. However, it's not been quite as straightforward as people thought. Kherson lies on the River Dnipro. The Russians have simply retreated to the far side of the River Dnipro, the east side, which lies on primarily Russian-controlled turf, and they've just started take, shelling the city from afar. So when I was there, there was really not more than, you know, barely any moment of the day where you could not hear shelling from, from some point. Some of it, admittedly, was Ukrainian outgoing shelling rather than Russian incoming shelling. But um, when I was there, there was a, at least two or three people killed, I think, in um, in just pretty much random shelling of tower blocks and civilian areas. And as a result of that, the city now has got even less people in it than it was when it was occupied. Um, uh, about uh, about two thirds of the city's population of three hundred thousand fled during the occupation, so they were down to something like a hundred thousand. They're now down to about fifty thousand. So, for example, Independence Square, sorry, Freedom Square, which is the main square where all the big parties were back when I was there in November, that was more or less completely empty when I was there, as were a lot of districts of the city. It it really did have the feel of a ghost town. Well, thank you very much, Colin and Dom, uh, for those updates. Uh, It's a great pleasure to welcome our guest uh, now, Jessica Aro. Jessica, thank you so much for your time. Um, Would you like to start just by introducing yourself to our listeners and telling us why you decided to write a book about Russian trolls in 2014? Thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor. I am a journalist from Finland, Helsinki. Uh, Greetings to everyone and also an author. In addition, I train um, people, audiences, to recognize and counter Russian information warfare. So I travel quite a lot uh, in conferences. And why I wanted to make the book it was kind of like the book demanded me to write itself because as I started to share my own experiences about how I started to become the victim of various crimes after I started to investigate the Russian information warfare against Ukraine and international audience, uh, as soon uh, people started to tell their stories how they had also become the targets of different crimes and attacks from trolls and fake news. So then I realized there's a pattern there and I need to make the book to expose this pattern. So maybe it's worth starting from the beginning. If you were to explain this subject to somebody who's not on the internet, how would you describe Russian disinformation on social media and and, and trolling in general? And how are they connected to the Kremlin? 
you can actually pretty much look at what the Russian senior of- official, officials are saying themselves. They are saying it out in the open. They are conducting information warfare. They are even presenting some of their governmental media, such as Ru- Russia Today, and telling openly that it's a channel and tool of information warfare. So you can believe what they are telling in that regard. So the Russians are using these tools and channels in order to influence real people's ideas, attitudes, and even behavior. They can go as far as to weaponize real people, turn them into agents of chaos, or have them voting for the candidate which is the most beneficial for the Kremlin, or just add chaos to Western societies. You know, the Russians have been up to this ever since at least 1950s, when the then KGB um, got the task to modernize itself, and they started to think of ways of harming the West without kinetic physical warfare. And this is what they came up with, fake information campaigns. They really do hurt us. So looking at the last eight years or since 2014, could you talk us through a couple of examples of this? And, and who exactly are we talking about? Where, where do these trolls live online? Of course, for example, the super brave, independent Russian journalists uh, who still existed uh, at least back in 2014 exposed this super interesting place which had been named as the Troll Factory, located not so far from Finland, uh, in St. Petersburg in Russia, in which in this office building these young adults were operating and working as so-called trolls, as they had named themselves. So what they did was they were putting up these fake profiles and personalities on social media and through those spreading pro-Putin commentaries and comments. So this is what the Russian independent journalists uncovered. And I started to look into how do these social media propaganda warriors impact real people in real people's thinking and that's uh, that's what got me really into into investigating this topic and then i continued from there to also looking into how russian security services are in fact behind many of these operations and and inserting these seeds of fake information into our local media systems and try to get them uh, turn into big scandals that the local journalists also take part in. That's absolutely fascinating. I mean, one question I think would be, how, how has this changed since, since you were looking at this um, 2014 and onwards? Um, have you seen the patterns, uh, the posts and the trolls' behaviour change over the past eight years? I feel they have become even more hardcore and even more aggressive after the 24th of February last year. The announcement of Putin um, the same day where he justified the attack and the escalated warfare against Ukraine was the purest form of very evil information warfare where he had many different target audiences. And now we are witnessing this um, very radicalized populations and audiences who have been targets of this information warfare for already years and years, but now they're becoming even more radicalized because now they also have to justify this full-blown genocide, war crimes in an industrial scale. But also what is what has really changed, in my opinion, is how like aggressively uh, senior Kremlin's officials are conducting information warfare on a daily basis to their both domestic audiences, but also internationally. You can even see, even in any Western country, the, the main headlines of different medias. Every day, they often they provide us Russian lines of, of the Kremlin's information warfare. It's often, for example, threatening us with nukes, or threatening us with World War III if we, we provide, for example, military assistance to Ukraine. So we are being threatened, our emotions are being manipulated, and I feel that it has really taken a turn for the worst after uh, last year, February. 
And do you think um, Western countries and their intelligence agencies have, have woken up to, the, to this danger? No, unfortunately. I wish, you know, I have been talking about this topic and trying to lobby for better, better legislation to support and protect citizens uh, from this sinister form of public manipulation and brainwashing. And one way of trying to protect the populations would be to uncover these different information warfare operations while they are ongoing. Because now we are seeing examples of Russian operations being uncovered only years after they have already taken their toll. And I feel that is that is really a problem. So if the Russian trolls are helping helping, for example, far-right or neo-Nazi candidates to win elections, I feel it would really be the, the job of the intelligence services to uncover these operations and spread information about them in order to build resilience in, in real people, in the target audiences that they are targeted to. So, you know, often these targets are very deep in the, in the rabbit holes, and it's not easy to uncover these operations. If you're just a regular journalist, you just don't have the means to go uh, into these secret channels and and uh, rabbit holes where where these operations are being conducted. So unfortunately, we we are in big need of intelligence service help. You talked about societal resilience to Russian disinformation and and, and, and fake news and everything. Um, your own country, Finland, has been lauded for its approach to countering misinformation. Could you tell us a little bit more about how Finland does this and what could other countries learn? Mm. Yeah, I feel that there is this mm, common sense, the common idea uh, not to trust Russian information, not to trust Russian medias. We understand the concept of propaganda quite well, but also, you know, because many Finns have personal experiences about Russian aggression and Russian warfare against our country and how our own grandmothers and fathers have been forced to defend this country. So we all have heard these stories. We cherish those stories. And we have this kind of suspicion towards the Kremlin. So there's that. But then there's also, of course, the free education, high um, quality education and even, you know, free university. That all helps. You mentioned earlier that you, you yourself were targeted by Russian trolls. What, what happened to you and what happened to them? Yeah, I have been made the target of various different aggravated crime, crimes and even stalking. As soon as in 2014, so already eight years ago, I started to investigate the then new phenomenon of Russian information warfare, the so-called social media trolls and how they impact real people. I was made first target of Russian language fake news in which there were libels, slander against me. I was being portrayed as this secret operative and helper of NATO, Baltic country security services, and so forth. And also my contact information was published. So all angry people started attacking me, calling me, threatening me. But you know, this was only the beginning. It continued for years and years of field campaigns in different quite big and popular pro-Kremlin fake news sites in which I was being portrayed as a drug user, drug dealer, mentally ill, lie, CIA operative, and just basically a threat to Finnish national uh, security. So there are still populations who really hate me to gods and some of my compatriots even want to kill me because they have, you know, digested and believed all these stories. So there has been serious threat to my own personal safety. So I have been forced to move away from Finland even for a couple of years. Um, but I took some of these aggravators to court and managed to win uh, some of them. But unfortunately, I'm still seeing on a weekly basis uh, the end results of these campaigns. There are still real people in Finland who just feel that I'm the liar and I invented Russian trolls from my own imagination and they don't exist anywhere else. Jessica, one more question from me, then I know Dom has a few, if that's all right. I, I guess the sort of the, the part of the, the, the larger picture here is uh, is control of the narrative, control of what or at least influence over what people believe. And I, I think certainly in in Western countries, certainly from what I think 
for example, Dom and I, maybe Colin as well, see is that the Ukrainian narrative is very much in the ascendance amongst the vast majority of people who, who, who. I mean, may, maybe this is just a British perspective, right? But like most Brits, I think, are very suspicious of Russian disinformation, Russian information sources, thanks to events like the Salisbury po- poisonings just a few years ago. So, I, so I, w- I wanted to hear your thoughts on whether you think Russia in, in the last year is actually still still winning this war or not. Yes, unfortunately, you know, there are so many populations, so many different target groups that we haven't even yet even recognized how to help. For example, Russia conducts operations in African countries. I'm not sure if there is anyone, you know, helping and helping these populations to build resilience towards. You know, there are news that many, for example, African developing countries are actually supporting Russia in its efforts, in its war against Ukraine. And this, I cannot think of any other reason than information operations, as well as cooperation coming from Russia to these countries. Obviously, it's not only information warfare, but it's also that. And then uh, the same applies to to uh, many of these operations. I don't feel that many of these, the impact and the influence of these operations have been really understood or even investigated or researched. So I would really, really love to see some investigation, some research. For example, I have to mention one, there has been one uh, concerning the Russian influence and interference in US elections 2016, when they were promoting Donald Trump as the president of United States. There is a US research that has been made. And are, according to that research, Russian trolls were in a key position turning uh, the minds of 80,000 voters that ended up making the difference that put Donald Trump as the president. So, you know, they might be not winning in the Ukraine theme here in the West, but they have so many other themes and they are winning, unfortunately, in some of the target groups. Well, thank you very much for all of that, Jessica. Dom, I know you've got a few questions. Can I bring you in here? Sure, thanks, David. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for for joining us here. I had the very, very good fortune last week to go and chat to James Rubin, who's President Biden's special envoy for countering disinformation, basically. Six weeks into the job, but he's he's very keen to to get stuck in and, and tackle that. And he was describing Russian and Chinese misinformation and use use of the information narrative as you as you've described and he was describing on the chinese part quite a sophisticated operational model for example he he described how in some countries in africa china has offered the the access to the xinhua news agency information so things that would appear in the african press would be from an african journalist um edited by by that paper but the information will come from Xinhua and there's, you know, they're not going to criticise China. They will criticise the US and elsewhere. So this, that was a very subtle operation of extending Chinese narrative. And it just sort of contrasts somewhat with Russia's a bit more clunky use, I would suggest. So the, so the IRA, the Internet Research Agency you've referred to in St. Petersburg. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the trolls that come at me, I mean, it's just so obvious and boring and you know, I ignore most. I play with some. I mute a few. I never block them because I like. The, I just mute them. I like the thought of them just shouting, shouting into the dark, not aware that I've, you know, long since left and gone have a cup of tea. But you know, do you do you see this more sophisticated sort of Chinese outfit or or vice a, a somewhat clunkier Russian effort? And I'm thinking things like the grain deal and how how Russia's extended their their ideas about about what was happened to grey and across Africa and elsewhere. Am I being am I seeing them as too clunky and, and, and sort of you know industrial with their use of this stuff vice a, a more sophisticated application? About China I haven't ever looked in, in there, so I really cannot say. But c- can you please give an example concerning Russia so maybe I'll be able to give a better answer? Yeah, so I'm just thinking about the um the way that Russia is using the narrative around the grain export, saying to countries across Africa and, and elsewhere around the world that actually the reason the grain's not getting to you, fellas, is not it's not us, it's not it's not the war, not special military operation. It's it's nasty old NATO and it's Ukraine not allowing their ships yeah. out. And, you know, and I contrast that with with a lot of the trolls that come at me who are just so obvious and and predictable. And like I say, I, I play with some for a little while, and then I just get bored because mm. it's just not it's just not a fair fight. 
Right, yeah. Well, you know, these Russian trolls have been all over accusing NATO and Western countries and European Union and United States, for example, about the war in Ukraine altogether. When I started to look into this 2014, I found I listed some of these Russian troll narratives in cooperation with audience uh, who was doing this investigation with me. So already back then they were just accusing everyone else about the stuff they were doing um, besides, of course, themselves. For example, according to them already back in 2014, they were saying that it was Ukraine who shot down MH17 or it was uh, it's actually Ukrainians fighting with each other. So these trolls, you know, and, and I, I have to say, even though they might appear, you know, humorous to you, unfortunately, they you are not kind of their target group. Their target group takes them seriously. And that's a problem. Yeah, I should say, actually, when I, when I said it's not a fair fight, I mean that, that I can run rings around them as anybody who can string a sentence together can because they just they can't do irony for starters. They have no argument to back up. They just hurl abuse and that's that's about it. And then they go for what aboutery. So when you ask them a question, they'll say, ah, ah what about the Iraq war, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not fair in that regard. It's just too easy to run rings around them. Do you think it's worth engaging with these people? And what value do you put on ideas such as, as NAFO? I see we've both got our fella emojis up there, or whatever whatever they are, our memes. But do, do you think do you think NAFO is any good? Is people around the, around the world that feel frustrated and angry, they can't, they can't do something to fight back against this Russian... Aggression. I mean, I, I I say they can through words. Do you think it is worth in get people engaging on online, or is it a, is it a fool's errand? Well, that depends on you know what kind of values one has in life, and what an individual wants from their life. So you know, it's everyone's own choice, but it doesn't really take you anywhere except if you have some extra time. Then of course, but. It's absolutely needed to engage whenever they are, for example, attacking someone. Uh, and with engaging, I mean so provide support to any victims or any targets that might be alone facing a troll army, attacking them, accusing them, calling them names, threatening to kill them. Because this is what I found was already happening back in 2014 to, you know, these regular social media users who are just voicing out opinions or information about the Kremlin's policies, they uh, were made targets of Russian trolls, harassment and attacks. So, for example, NAFO. NAFO is a perfect example of a community that can help and that does make a difference. You know, these Russian trolls also, they try to really break down communities in the West. They want to make us feel passive. They want us to disengage from the conversations. They want to stop us from spreading real information about the Kremlin. So NAFO and other supporting communities have a massive role in enabling all that and in, in making people remember that they are not alone. Their trolls want to make you feel that you are alone facing this aggression, but in fact you are not. And I feel that, for example, the Finnish people, what they did when these trolls were attacking them, they often grouped around someone who was attacked and this is what NAFO does and I feel that it's really healthy. Thanks yes I, I do too and just finally if, if I may in terms of wider societal resilience and I think Finland is way ahead of, of most of Europe most of the world in this regard and, and in terms of how people we're getting better at understanding how, how we receive information through questioning and, and, and fact checking and source checking and I always say everything that we say on this pod people should question and check and fact check and source check and all, and all the rest of it but do you think our kids are going to be more sophisticated consumers of information are we still in the wild west of, of interweb and all that kind of jazz are our kids going to be better at, at, at source checking fact checking and seeing these these trolls for what they are than, than we are I would really hope so and usually when you see people negatively engaging with this spreading Russian troll material, like real people, real citizens who have been turned into Russian trolls, basically, they are like plus 50 something. You know, um, there seems to be an age type of element there, but also, of course, different political elements 
into who find this material interesting enough to spread it uh, in their networks it's usually not the kids so we are already in a in a positive position in that regard but i would also like to point out that it's our adults responsibility to protect the kids who are alone on social media and facing this material because this material breaks down adults minds so kids should not be left alone on social media to handle any of this well thank you dom for your questions jessica thank you so much for your time is there anything more you'd like to say that you think our audience should understand about the threat of putin's as you call them putin's troll army they are a national security threat in many countries and they will continue to be and as our president Saul Niinistö has said already 2015 I can completely relate to what he said he said that it's the it's every citizen's responsibility to defend your country also online when faced with fake fake information so I feel like that and I feel that uh, it's time to start defending our countries from Russian trolls who try to occupy our countries through our minds. Jessica thank you so much for your time. Colin Freeman can I come to you in your time in Ukraine you spent a session with Zelensky in in a in a big well in a, in a big press conference really you wrote a very interesting piece about this can you tell us what that experience was like Yes, we were finally in the court of the king, as it were. This was a press conference that he held on February the 24th to mark the anniversary of the war. There was me thinking, oh, um, maybe I'll get a kind of exclusive with the president. I was told I was on the uh, the the shortlist for what appeared to be a fairly select audience of journalists, foreign journalists and local journalists um, to meet Zelensky on that day. And it, it was it was billed as a press conference, but I was kind of hoping it might be a, you know, a round table with me and maybe uh, 20 others or something like that. Fat chance, we were told to report not to some secret bunker, but to the uh, Intercontinental Hotel in downtown Kiev, the, the, the flagship hotel in Kiev. There was about 500 of us there in total, all crammed into a, a big downstairs um, basement ballroom area. Um, the security was pretty tight, but I, I think the fact that Zelensky was prepared to turn up to an event, you know, to a gathering of that size, which was, we were told not to mention it to anyone else in advance. But really, if you're telling 500 people in advance that you're going to be in a certain place, I think the Russian eavesdropping technology could probably have worked out that something was going on with all these journalists ringing their bosses saying, you know, Zelensky this, Zelensky that. It was certainly a very a marked contrast from this time last year when uh, he was basically on the run and the Russians were invading Kiev. They had um, troops of special forces tasked with either capturing him, capturing him or killing him. And you may re- well remember that famous kind of street corner press conference that he gave, filmed on his virus sort of selfie video he did on his iPhone, saying, really, look, folks, I'm still here. My defence minister is still here. We are not going anywhere. Don't believe the rumours that I've fled the country. And um, the man we met a few days ago, I, a year on, I, I think you could say he really was at the height of his powers. He had 500 um, international journalists all absolutely agog uh, at the prospect of meeting him and um, very interested to hear what he had to say. So what did he say? Well, um, I'll, I'll run, a f- run through a, f- a few of the, the, the serious points he made first. He was pretty emphatic that there'd be no negotiations with the Russians while any Russian troops were still fighting on Ukrainian soil. He warned also that the Russians might start to look to pick on weaker nations, weaker neighbours. Um, I guess you might be thinking about places like Georgia or Moldova in that respect. He was pretty pissed off with the Russian population. He said if if they cared more about this, then Russia wouldn't be at war. He wasn't just you know, blaming it purely on the evil Mr. Putin, as it were. He he pledged to try, he said Ukraine needs to do more to get to work with Africa and the Latin American nations that have thus far either sat on the fence, that thus far sat on the fence um, over the war and not supported Ukraine very much. And there was also a touch of the, um, the, the old Zelensky humour there as well. When asked by, I think, a German reporter, 
um, whether he thought that, um, he, that the threat against him from Mr. Putin had diminished anymore. He said, well, I'm surprised you're asking me that. You know, I thought the Germans had quite a good line in, of communication into Mr. Putin um, the, the, uh, themselves anyway. So there was definitely, you know, it, it was vintage Zelensky stuff um, and there was tears at the end. So a, a pretty good performance all round, really, and also um, a revelation that um, he was planning to meet uh, Xi Jinping uh, or has asked for an audience with Xi Jinping at some point, which I think these days he's probably got the clout to do. That's quite something. Colin, just very quickly on that, I mean, something you wrote in your piece for The Spectator, I noticed, was that you thought that maybe this kind of massive gathering wasn't so, didn't give itself really to, to, to deep analysis or deeper questions. And every single national journalist is really just trying to get the question in for their own audience. Could you talk about that a little bit? That's right. If you cover a press conference, back when I was a reporter in the UK, I used to do a lot of stuff, you know, covering press conferences of politicians or police sometimes doing murder cases. And um, a, a Fleet Street press pack often works quite well together. You, you go for the jugular, you look for the, you know, you, you, you go for the key lines. And if somebody swerves or, or dodges the issue, um, well, you know, whoever's convening the press conference, somebody else will follow up and say, right, hang on, you haven't answered that. Can you please answer the question? And if whoever it is doesn't do, then then the the, the point is made themselves. The, 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 their, their, their evasiveness is made clear. With a big press co- conference like this, you've got thousands or five hundred journalists. Everybody kind of you know really only really looking for their own you know what what's what will make a headline for their own channels back home and so there was rather a lot of slightly parochial questions you know should the australian embassy be reopened what do you have a, do you have a message for president lula of brazil should spain do more to encourage president lula of brazil's peace plan which i don't think anybody really thinks is one that is much of a, a runner anyway it's one of about a dozen peace plans uh, you know all these questions coming from the sort of national tv stations of the countries concerned um frankly i would probably have done the same if, I, if i'd had the chance to ask a question which i didn't i would well have said something like you know what do you have to say to ukrainian refugees in britain or what do you you know get some kind of british line which would have pleased my editor no no doubt but it, you know, if I was a Ukrainian listening to that press conference on what was a very momentous occasion, I would have come away probably thinking I'm not really that, you know, we, we've not really heard an awful lot from Zelensky that we didn't already know. And a lot of these questions as a Ukrainian are not of that much relevance to us, and, you know, nor were, the, nor were many of them of that much relevance to us in Britain either. But that is the nature of these big international jamborees, um, journalism by committee you could argue. Having said that, you know, some people did um, ask serious questions that, that addressed the, very much the bigger picture. And for example, he, he was asked at one point, um, if you are in the same position this time next year, still losing soldiers at the same rate and, and really still facing a situation where the war has just not really moved particularly one way or the other, how will you feel? And he said, he, he said, I, I'm going to have to paraphrase, but he said words to the effect that, you know, our mor- there is a risk our morale will start to sap by then. And that is a drama that I do not wish to think about. And that struck me as interesting because it's not often that he puts specific timelines on things. And so basically he was saying that we, we, you know, if we're still doing this in a year's time, that is not going to be good news. Colin, hi, it's Dom here. Just wonder if I can ask you a question. Thanks so much for for joining us. I'm always fascinated by the um, by the the theatre and the choreography of these things. And I remember when I was at the Munich Security. So what am I talking about? Munich Security. I was in Madrid for the NATO conference last year, and I was in the session when Boris Johnson turned up, which was mostly full of lobby, so political lobby correspondents rather than sort of defence people and NATO watchers and all that kind of jazz. And Boris Johnson, being the character he is, didn't want to take any tough questions so he it was absolutely scripted who who was able to ask a question and i just was not on the list i couldn't get on the list my arm was aching from sticking it in the air to try and get a question but no he just stuck to the list and had a load of packed questions that he, that he 
batted off. How did it work with President Zelensky? I'm just wondering, was there was there a list? Was it very controlled? And um, you, you say a lot of the international media got questions which they then used you know, for their own domestic agenda. Fine, you might say there's a missed opportunity, but there, there we go. So d- how did it work between questions from the international media and and the domestic Ukrainian media? How much was this actually trying to get information out to people and how much of it was was theatre, either from the Ukrainians and Zelensky or theatre for the for the journalists themselves? So every journalist in the room was given a large card with the name of their organisation on it. And while he was speaking in this press conference, it went on for three hours, I should, I should stress, which is far longer than any UK press conference would normally go for. So, yeah, during that time, you had to kind of hold your card up like a placard to, in a bid to get your question asked, you know, in a bid to get the microphone. And uh, alongside him, he had a chap whose, whose job it was to sort of choose who was going to get the questions. The questions were not pre-scripted in advance, in any way and um but 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 apart from a few at the beginning they started off with christian alan poor from cnn apart from that and one or two other you know big beasts from the tv world it was done fairly democratically so there was a question from mexican tv for example there was a question from polish tv there was a question from azerbaijani tv and you know the the idea being really that it, it would be it would be shared around the na- the the chance to get the question would be shared around the nations of the world and it wouldn't just be the you know the the, the established big mainstream media players like CNN there was also for example quite a lot of local ukrainian television stations and media channels and, and a few others from, from mainly from the the former eastern bloc that whose name i didn't i didn't instantly recognize but it, yeah it was a pretty democratic affair my sense if there was an agenda certainly none of the the questions were were prescripted in advance my sense if there was an agenda it was that he wanted to get questions from all over the world and with a view possibly to making sure that those countries might be brought on side to you know to 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 start voting for Ukraine in at the UN if they weren't already doing so really just you know to to, to mobilize as much global attention and hopefully as much global support in Ukraine's direction as possible well, thank you, Dom and Colin, for that. Just, I mean, it's very interesting, Colin, to hear you talking about that, especially just after hearing a 20-minute interview with somebody about Russian disinformation, just to see how these information narratives play out in the mainstream press, play out, play out online, play out on social media as well. So that's, um, that's, that's really fascinating. So I think we've, it's really good that we've been able to put those two things alongside each other. Um, Dom, can I ask you for any final updates from you? Yeah, so the last one to think about, the Association of National Olympic Committees of Africa. They had a meeting over the weekend in Mauritania and they passed a resolution on Saturday allowing Russian and Belarusian athletes to compete in the 2024 Paris Olympics as neutrals. Now, the body's president, Mustafa Beraf, he said that this aligns with the position of the International Olympic Committee and he is correct there. The IOC set out a path in January for Russian and Belarusian athletes to earn Olympic places, basically, through Asian qualifying events and compete as neutrals with no flags or anthems. Now, we've seen that um, fall over in, in recent months. That uh, There was that gymnast that had the Z on his... Was it a singlet? A singlet when I, used to, when I used to do gym. But anyway, the, the thing he was wearing. Um, Let, let's focus on that, Dom, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you photos. You know, so this has fallen foul. There's supposed to be no flags or anthems. Quite whether that extends into the crowd, we don't know. Again, we saw that in the the Australian Open with uh, Russian supporters of Novak Djokovic. So interesting question there. But um, Mr. Baraf said, uh, quote, the members came out unanimously in favour of the participation of Russian and Belarusian athletes in all international competitions. It will thus be a question of allowing Russian and Belarusian athletes to compete to participate in complete neutrality without any sign of identity in the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. Politics cannot put pressure on sport and withdraw from it all its nobility, values which revolve around peace, unity and solidarity. The athletes must in no case pay the heavy price of a conflict, whatever it is and wherever it is, unquote. Now, Ukraine, many Eastern European Baltic countries uh, saying there should be a ban on Russian and Belarusian athletes 
in, and in February, more than 30 countries, including the US, Britain and France, pledged support for that position. Ukraine's also threatened to boycott the Olympics over Russia's participation. So one to note, we will, of course, talk more about about the Olympics. I have to say, I, I, I've, I can't really decide yet. I don't know where I stand really on on inclusion or exclusion of athletes. I want sport to be a a separate place away from politics, but of course that you know this is the modern world. It doesn't always it's not always that easy. But I, I have I've yet to take a position on it. I'd be interested in listeners listeners' thoughts on this. Um, but I think that's worth worth noting that um, the Association of National Olympic Committees of Africa passed that resolution unanimously over the weekend. Well, thank you very much, Dom and Colin, for all of your thoughts and your expertise. Can I just ask both of you for your final thoughts? What will you be looking at or thinking about in the coming weeks? Uh, Colin, can I go to you first? Hello, yes. Well, certainly, just going back to the press conference a bit, it's very easy to get the sense that President Zelensky is having an an easy ride at these press conferences and forgetting that, you know, he is a, a human fallible politician like anybody else. And um, he, you know, with it, within Ukraine itself, he was not, a, not, you know, not a universally popular figure after three years in government, despite his um, initial landslide vote. But I, I did ask people when I was there just this last time, whether there is any signs now of political divisions opening up in any way, um, given that the country did have quite a large pro-Russian faction within its political landscape, or, or certainly a, you know people who are fairly neutral on that question, rather than being explicitly pro-Western, you 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 could see a situation a year on where maybe differences of opinion had, had begun to emerge. Uh, on, for example, whether the Ukraine should simply fight on and take Crimea as well, or whether the cost of all this was just simply beginning to get a bit too much, and that um, it, you know it, it was a bit, it was time to maybe start thinking about negotiations of one sort or another, as the as many Western nations have been hinting Ukraine should do. My sense from speaking to people was though that that is not really that there is not much difference of opinion developing yet certainly it's not coalesced or crystallized into anything meaningful at the at the you know at the national political level there was no block agitating certainly in in public or in any other way for a, an early end to the war or any any kind of peace you know peace discussions in in other words they seem pretty on side with um the president when he said at the press conference we don't want to discuss any kind of peace deal until all putin's troops are off ukrainian soil and that in his view also includes crimea thank you very much colin freeman dom nichols yeah so i was thinking when when colin was speaking earlier on about his visit to Hezon and the um and the actions there from the civil community whether you go as far as to say partisans and what have you, or it's certainly partisan activity, it just made me think of the special operations executive in the Second World War. And if anybody's interested in that and um, and the kind of activities that these forces get up to that operate in and amongst the civilian population are largely civilians themselves, but but taking a stand and, and operating in it with a, with military effect. I cannot recommend highly enough the book by MRD Foot, uh, Michael Foot, MRD Foot. Um, called the SOE 1940 to 46. You'll you'll find it online. I mean, a brilliant book and really exposes what these people go through. Now, that obviously was written about the SOE in the Second World War. But as Colin was speaking, and as we've been thinking about this stuff for the last few months, I just there were so many parallels there for the for the emotions that the individuals have to go through. Um, often a very lonely place, very terrifying place, operating on your own or in small groups. You don't know who to trust. You don't know if the next meet you're going to go to has been compromised. I mean, the, the, the idea there of having... I mean, it's when he said that the, the cocktail, Negroni, was the code word for the, for, the, for the woman who ran the bar being compromised. I mean, that's straight out of the history books. It's absolutely amazing how these, these techniques and practices that stood stood the test of time and and worked against you know a fearsome organization such as the Gestapo a funny old thing they're being repeated again today so if you're at all interested in partisan activity not only for the for the for fascinating historical examples from the second world war but also for how it must feel to be in that position because there are people today right now feeling these emotions i i recommend that book mrd foot um he was a, a military historian and, and was himself i think a member of the soe but the soe 40 to 46 a brilliant book recommend it 
Thank you very much, Dom and Colin. Just a note from me, we've seen Phillips O'Brien, who uh, Dom mentioned earlier on, the Professor of Strategic Studies at the University of St. Andrews, has shared a uh, official notice from the Ukrainian government in which, um, basically, they believe uh, that the Bakhmut should continue to be defended uh, and reinforced, um, which is quite quite something to see at this point. Um, so we'll try and look at that again tomorrow. I'm just looking at the text here in English. Um, so yes, we'll try and bring you more on that tomorrow. The battle does. If the battle is continuing. Uh, just goes. Yeah, but who's the audience, David? Who's the audience there? Who is the audience that Ukrainian the Ukrainian authorities are putting that out to? Fascinating. I mean, you know, right back into what we were saying earlier on. If that's the message they want Russia to 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 receive, because they are still dying in their thousands, then what what better way to make them continue what they're doing? As Napoleon said, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Dom, Colin and Jessica. We last spoke to our next interviewee at the end of 2022. If you're interested and want to listen back, our chat was broadcast on the 21st of November. For security reasons, we changed their voice and were careful about what we discussed. Well, we kept in touch and I wanted to call them again to understand how their operation had changed through the war and what new challenges await those people who help supply the front lines and the soldiers fighting. Like before, we have changed the voice of the volunteer. I started by asking them to reintroduce what they do. Well, I realised actually this morning, that this time last year, I was in the UK with a flight booked from London to Kiev on, on the 23rd of February in the evening. This time last year, I was getting increasingly worried that that was going to get cancelled. I was looking back for my own messages, and I was sort of messaging friends in Kiev, seeking reassurance that um, I would be able to make it. And they kept sending me sarcastic pictures of everyday life with, you know, like them in a cafe or something, saying, uh, no tanks yet, I think. Obviously, it got cancelled the evening of the 23rd. And um, I had a long conversation with a friend on the morning of the 24th. She said she wasn't going to leave, but she was afraid that Kiev would have to eventually capitulate, partly to protect its historical buildings and so on. And she was sure that the West would do nothing to help, like in 2014. She said, like, so you the Nord. So, like, I don't know where the goblin will stop, and I don't know what will stop him. And her view was that this could end up in, you know, the Baltic states or Poland, um, in the same way that the Crimea invasion had led to this attack on Kiev. I try and remind myself <laughs> the situation we're in now would have seemed impossibly optimistic back then. It's easy to forget how far we've come, actually. But back then, like like all of us, I was, I was very shocked, increasingly frustrated at not being able to help. And so I messaged around some friends who knew Ukraine, and we collected together some money, bought some drones, army surplus kit, medical supplies, and found a route into Kyiv from the south, so the only place in which there was a gap in the Russian siege. I was able to supply soldiers from inside the city through March and April until the Russian retreat. And I've been in Ukraine ever since. So how does your fund work exactly? Well, a friend of mine described it some months back as sort of Dunkirking the Donbass. And we sort of liaise with units that are fighting at the front. And we build relationships with them. And we find out what kit they need and what they will need. Sometimes what they don't realise they need, but they don't know exists. And we drive it from the UK directly to their unit at the front in the vehicles they've already requested. And the majority of the vehicles, I would say, that we deliver are like Mitsubishi L200 pickups or Nissan Navaras. They're sort of the Henry Hoover of battlefield vehicles. Very reliable, very well known. Everyone knows how to fix them. Everyone knows their foibles. I was reminded, actually, their value last month delivering a delivering to a unit in Bakhmut. And they still had two L200s that we had supplied them in April, converted into multiple rocket launch systems, which were being used to defend Bakhmut. <laughs> so they originally bought from UK farmers for a few grand, and they've been used at the front now for almost a year. And the guys in that unit actually had a few Humvees from US military stocks, but they could rarely actually use them because there's sort of there's quite serious fuel shortages at that kind of area of the front because it's such fierce fighting. There's no electricity, so it's huge attrition of resources. Like all the electricity has to come from generators to power all their drones, their heating, everything. You know, wherever the fighting is actually heaviest, you tend to find that fuel is the shortest. Like they pointed out to me, they said, you know, a Humvee can do four miles per gallon. <laughs> Um, an L200 does 30 miles per gallon. 
sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense for battlefield transport. The fuel issue is something we don't talk about enough, I think. Um, and in a drone war like this one, obviously where your position can be spotted and shelved within minutes, like reliable mobility is key. So like you need something that when you turn the starter key, it'll actually start up and let you get out. So pickups are still used for like most evacuation, most drone operators, anti-tank units, like basic supply rolls, that kind of thing. And this is somewhere actually the UK really punches above its weight. Like it has a huge part to play. It's the biggest pickup country in Europe. The most important part is what we actually fill them with. So we only buy things we can get for better value here than elsewhere, sort of force multiplier kit, small things hard to get hold of in Ukraine, but which help maintain larger systems. If we get things literally from Amazon, we actually ask them to show us what they want using Amazon links very often. But we also work with a lot of army surplus. So we get, you know, we've delivered a lot of British army Arctic sleeping bags over the winter for obvious reasons and winter boots. We get those for about £20 each, which I think it's fair to say is cheaper than any other fund I've seen. So we try to focus on the things that other people aren't good at, more niche stuff, stuff that's hard to buy, hard to coordinate. So the last few deliveries, we've done things like winter camouflage netting, um, quad bikes for trailers. Quad bike trailers are in great demand because you can carry anti-tank weapons around the battlefield. You can carry your, your javelins and whatever else on, around on the battlefield with you. They were used a lot behind enemy lines uh, back in September. Small silent generators, very popular because obviously you can be a, a forward operating drone operator with a small generator to charge your batteries between flights. Very gratifyingly, some of our biggest donations come from Ukrainians who've either worked with us or, or seen what we do firsthand. Well, let's just go into that a little bit more because part of the reason uh, we wanted to talk to you again was because but you got back in touch after the podcast in uh, November to say how generous listeners of this podcast have been in, in supporting your work. And I thought it'd be really good. We've done this with a few with a few guests who found the same thing, actually. So it's always good, I think, to sort of follow the money and fi- find out actually what it was used for. So um, how did Ukraine The Latest listeners contribute to what, what you do? Well, until I spoke to you in November, we, we'd operated entirely through friends and family. So I, I wasn't really sure what to expect from, from sort of going more public. And I was pretty astonished. I mean, we, we left that email address, ukraine.equipment at gmail.com in the notes. And we had like almost 200 different people like contacted us to try and help. As well as money, we've just received this bewilderingly diverse range of offers, like guys offering, like white van men offering to drive their transit vans, um, people offering to put us up in their houses in Germany and in Poland and Romania while we were en route, people sending drones from Australia. We had a guy who owned a sign factory in the north of England who offered to make signs for us, 3D printing, like British Army um, soldiers offering like a whole set of old British, field, British Army field kit they had. We've had whole Mitsubishi L200 pickup trucks delivered, uh, L400s, generators. We've got 16 mobile ultrasound scanners, uh, socks, paraffin heaters. And we even had like an elderly Rhodesian war veteran <laughs> who sent us an extended sort of detailed guide about adapting civilian vehicles to wartime, like based on his own like decades of experience in the bush. We had a man offering to raise money by giving flying experiences in his tiger moth. We had, so we had a tire repair center that offered to donate a percentage of every tire sold, that kind of thing. But biggest has really been like people who have set up their own GoFundMe page or whatever, have raised their own money. We've been able to put them in touch with a military unit, and then they've worked with the military unit, bought a vehicle, filled it with kit, and driven it out to that unit themselves. The unit provides them with all the documentation for the border and often escorts from the border, that kind of thing. People are very touched that people come out that far. Like One of the drivers we had in January, he was he went to a bar in Lviv when he arrived that evening, and someone asked him what he was doing there. And when he told them, they just burst into tears. Um, I think it's that sort of sense of not being alone that other people are making sacrifices as well. So the last delivery, we delivered to four different sections of the front, like right the length of it. All four were either donated or driven by Ukraine, the latest listeners. All um, four? Wow. Yeah. I have to say all of them uh, have agreed to drive next time as well. But I spotted um, one of the Ukrainians who helped guide the January convoy. He wrote on the WhatsApp group of one of the guys who delivered and um I thought I'd read out what he said, because it's sort of really directed at all your listeners, basically. Words on the screen of WhatsApp will, of course, fail to express the gratitude we feel here in Ukraine for support from so far, 
which came during the most difficult of times. Having a reliable vehicle like the ones he provided usually means the difference between life and death for Ukrainian soldiers, as demonstrated by the unfortunate situation this soldier and his people found themselves in just a few days earlier. Simply being able to start a car and move out to position might mean discovering enemy forces on time to save the lives of squads, platoons and companies, which above all rely on their eyes in the sky. And they'll be able to do this just that, all thanks to you. If any of you decide to visit Ukraine now, in a month, in a year, at the point victory comes, which will be your victory as well, or in 10 years, please don't hesitate to let me know, and I'll do everything in my limited power to provide you or your friends with accommodation, transport, entertainment, or anything you might need. You will always be welcome here, and will always be our friends. Um, and it's like most extraordinarily, we currently have 15 different listeners currently raising money to buy their own vehicles, drive their own kit out. So I don't know how many of those will be successful, but that's quite a substantial thing if it occurs. Looking forward now, um, when we're thinking of what people can do, is there anything else or anything different? How might that change in the coming year? It's a very unusual war. I, I think for three reasons. I think, first of all, pretty much anyone anywhere is able to actually make a difference. I think, I think the second point is there's just this very clear like goal to this war and a clear choice. You know, either Ukraine it's victorious or I mean I, I saw the look on the faces of those first soldiers returning from the relief of culture in March and that would be replicated in in every town every city every hamlet across Ukraine possibly for generations if they lose and I think the other way it's unusual is that like military aid is almost the purest form of humanitarian aid in the sense that I mean I've heard some of the amazing humanitarian work being done by volunteers on your podcast especially with like helping children who are displaced and so on it's incredibly, incredibly important. Ultimately, all of this sort of horror just won't stop until the war stops. And every day longer it continues, it means more deaths, more trauma, more destruction. You need to get the crocodile out of your kitchen before you can start mopping up the mess it's made. I think, unfortunately, victory is the only option. And that victory will come down to like a, an equation of men times material. And I'd like to contribute to the material side of the equation if it means fewer men dying. And like many of us out here in Ukraine, um, as David knows, there are many avid listeners in Kyiv. Um, I listen regularly to Ukraine the latest. And I heard um, John Nichols announcing that he'd been sanctioned by the Russian government, um, bemoaning the loss of his, his dacha outside Moscow. We've had many messages and... about that. Very sad. He's very, very sad. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said something quite interesting. He was talking about all the emails and he said that often he gets the sense that readers feel very disempowered and he quite rightly said they can help by using their voices talking about what's going on and so on and i think speaking out is really vital but i want people to understand that actually none of us are really disempowered there's so much we can do and the ukrainians are very very careful to make it as easy as possible for us to help you know there is no small donation i think there are sort of three basic forms of help. So the first is obviously money, which is always helpful. And I think the second is like equipment. So pickups and especially people who will buy them and drive them out. We have the units that are desperate for them. Um, if people are able to get them, what bikes really, really in need at the moment. And the third type is just sort of contacts and ideas and connections. Um, lots of our best initiatives have come from quite unexpected directions. But anyone interested in putting their shoulders to the wheel can, can email us at ukraine.equipment at gmail.com. And I think David will put it, put it in the notes. We'll put, we'll put it in the notes again. And I'd be very curious to see. I'm sure I'm very excited to check in in, in three months and find out the, the range of help that's been offered. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces, Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Emily Hill.